Well, thank you, Neil, for that really kind introduction. I seem a little bit embarrassed now. Um, so what I'd like to do today is really tell you about some of the developments that we've made over the last 10 to 15 years in terms of trying to unravel how the mycobacterial cell wall is synthesized. And obviously, many of the components that we find in the mycobacterial cell wall are key drug targets. But first, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit in terms of the bacterium. Um, I guess um, I arrived this morning. Um, I was away um, in London for the last few days. And I think when I came, I saw quite a few of my research group. And I think they've been out sort of frequenting Liverpool quite a lot over the last few days and are probably a bit more worse for wear. And they look a little bit like this character over here in terms of taking too much alcohol. But in any case, they, um, if we think about um, the bacterium, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, that's how it looks on a solid agar plate. It's an intracellular pathogen, um, resides within macrophages. And this is the sort of characteristic chest x-ray that we observe in terms of the haloing effect that we associate with the disease. If we think about the problems of tuberculosis, um, there are several factors. Um, if we go through in terms of looking at the global incidence rates in MDR and XDR TB, basically there are around 8 million new cases attributed to tuberculosis every year. And there's around 2 million deaths associated with the disease. Really, what we find is TB is associated with poverty and poor health care. And this sort of stems from when you look at the um, disease burden sort of globally. You find high case rates and deaths associated with South America, Africa, and parts of Asia. And really, you can see multidrug resistant tuberculosis really being predominant in parts of Africa and also parts of Asia. What we also have now is extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. So the key difference here is that with multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, you have resistance to the first-line agents. But with extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, you now have resistance to the second-line injectables that are used to treat tuberculosis. One of the staggering sort of statistics that has come out recently in terms of MDR-TB is that we've seen a 50% increase in terms of cases of MDR in the space of just 12 months. I think what was reported by the WHO were 200,000 cases attributed to MDR sort of 12 months ago. Now that has arisen to 500,000 cases. So clearly, drug resistance, MDR, XDR, TB, is putting TB on the fast forward. The second problem we have with tuberculosis is in terms of therapy and the length of therapy. We do have what's called DOTS, Directly Observed Treatment Short Course, uh, which is a little bit of a strange acronym when you think of the combination therapy that's required for tuberculosis. We have this initial phase of four drugs for two months consisting of rifampicin, isoniazid, ifambutol, and pyrazinamide. Then we have this continuation phase of two drugs for four months rifampicin and isoniazid. So you can see it's a very protracted therapy for tuberculosis over six months. In terms of MDR-TB, this actual stretches out for two years. We really have no solution for XDR-TB. <clears throat> the third problem that we associate really with tuberculosis is co-infection with HIV. Now, if we think about the in TB endemic population, probably around 90% have latent infections, and we have about a 5% risk of developing tuberculosis. But what happens when you have HIV in that population? You end up having a risk of 5% per year. And this sort of trend is moving this way due to reactivation. So really, WHO has declared TB as a global health problem. Now, when we start to think of chemotherapy and what are the alternatives, really if we go back and look at the discovery timeline of currently available TB drugs and when they were discovered, 
So the first line TB drugs that were used for drug sensitive TB were really discovered in the 50s and 60s. And this is when we had that golden era of chemotherapeutics for, for bacteria and for as antibacterials. Really, the second line agents came more in the, the later sort of 70s and 80s. But what you notice from 1980 onwards, there really hasn't been a major development in terms of new therapeutics for tuberculosis apart from two recently approved drugs. So when I entered the field um, many years ago, uh, too many that I can dare to count now, um, so I was inspired by Firstly, my PhD supervisor, Professor David Minikin at Newcastle, and he had a long interest in terms of bacterial cell walls. And Newcastle historically has been interested in bacterial cell walls. They had um, Sir James Badley there, who was interested in tychoic acid biosynthesis. So I entered the field at that time and wanted to understand about how the mycobacterial cell wall was synthesized. Now, to give you an overview in terms of the architecture, we have a basic sort of uh, membrane. We have peptidoglycan here. Attached to peptidoglycan through a muramic acid, through a um, phosphate linkage to n glucosamine. We have rhamnose. And this is quite a unique disaccharide bridge that connects arabinogalactan to peptidoglycan. If you look at the orange here, this is the linear galactan backbone that we have in arabinogalactan. It's, it's unusual in that it's a repeating part of the polysaccharide. It's um, 1, 5, 1, 6 linked. It's um, a beta-linked sugar. The interesting thing about the galactose in arabinogalactan is that it's in the furanose ring form. Then attached precisely at three points on the 8th, 10th, and 12th position of that galactan backbone, which stretches for around 25 sugar residues, we have three segments of arabinan. Now, each segment consists of around 25 arabinose residues. And these, again, are very unusual in that they're also in the furanose ring form. And these make up a variety of structural motifs. So you have different motifs that come together in terms of making the arabinan segment segments. And these are catalyzed by different glycosyl transferases. So you can have um, alpha-1,3, alpha-1,5, beta-1,2 linkages. So this sort of provides this polysaccharide that we associate with the mycobacterial cell wall. Now, one of the dominant and characteristic features that lends itself to what we always term as the, as the waxy cell wall of mycobacteria are the mycolic acids. Now, these are fairly unusual fatty acids in that they range in size from 70 to 90 carbon atoms. So we typically look at fatty acids that you know, 16 to 24 carbon atoms. But we're here we have this real sort of waxy outer layer consisting of these very hydrophobic fatty acids, which we term mycolic acids. These are also unusual in that they have various sort of structural motifs. So we have cyclopropane rings here, we have sort of keto groups, and we have methoxy groups. Now, the other unusual feature of the mycobacterial cell wall is the fact that we have a number of um, extra sort of um, cellular sort of lipids that we associate with the cell wall. So we have things such as the thiacyl dimycoserosates, which I've shown here, diacyl trahalose, we have this um, trahalose unit and associated fatty acids here. And we have things such as the phenolic glycolipid, where we have a sugar residue attached again to a structure that's very similar to the structure of thiacyl dimycoserosate. So you can see this now sort of comes in and intercalates with the mycolates to give that, again, very waxy feature that we associate with the TB cell wall. Associated then with the cell wall, anchored in the plasma membrane through a phosphatidyl inositol anchor, we have what we term liparabinomanan. It has this um, linear manan um, backbone, which, which is punctuated by alpha-1-2 branches. So we have a 1-6 backbone with two branches. Attached to that, we have a very similar arabinan segment as we find in arabinogalactan. And also, we have a variety of caps 
associated with Lipa Rabinamana. Now, one of the key challenges in terms of understanding how the mycobacterial cell wall is synthesized is trying to understand how these glycosyl transferases come together to make these macromolecular structures. And one of the big problems is that when you look at this bioinformatically, glycosyl transferases are very difficult to predict in genomes. However, you can use various sort of algorithms to search for what we term the GTC glycosyl transferases. But one of the big problems that we face when we try to um, work with these particular glycosyl transferases is that they tend to be membrane bound. They tend to have a number of transmembrane helices, which makes working with them very difficult. Associated with that, they have very unusual sugar substrates, which are lipid linked and very difficult to work with. But the key thing for us is that many of the processes involved in assembly are both arabinogalactan, the mycolic acids, and liparabinomanan are essential in TB. So actually trying to study the framework of how this cell wall is synthesized is potentially a hot area in terms of novel drug targets. And this is even more important when we consider some of the frontline agents that are used to treat tuberculosis. We have isoniazid, which targets aspects of mycolic acid biosynthesis, and we have ethambutol, which targets aspects of both arabinan synthesis in liparabinomanan and also arabinan synthesis in arabinogalactan. What I'd like to do is go through sort of systematically some of the knowledge that we've gained over the last few years in terms of how we build up the cell wall. So what I'll do first is start with give you a little bit of detail in terms of what we've done recently in terms of peptidoglycan biosynthesis. So typically there's been a, a lack of interest in peptidoglycan biosynthesis for a number of reasons, uh, mainly because of endogenous beta-lactamases, um, vancomycin is impeded from its accessing its target, um, MURE, one of the enzymes that catalyzes the initial stages of peptidoglycan synthesis is resistant to phosphomycin. And also, one of the other drugs, D-cycloserine, is um, not a very nice inhibitor. But what really came to fore a few years ago was the um, demonstration that if you had the dual combination of a, a meropenin and clavulanic acid, you can actually show that you could treat MDR and XDR TB. So, in essence, we sort of reinvented the wheel and we're coming back looking at peptidoglycan synthesis as a viable target in terms of antibacterials for TB. But one of the big problems is that the pathways is quite complex. So if we start at the beginning, we have what we refer to as MUR A, which takes UDP and acetylglucosamine, and with MUR B, makes what the initial building blocks of UDP and acetylmuonac. We then have mu C, which adds L-alanine. To that building block, we have mu D, which transfers d glue to give this dipeptide intermediate. We then have the transfer of DAP from mu E to give this tripeptide, then mu F to give this pentapeptide intermediate. This is then ligated to a polyprenol phosphate carrier to give this intermediate. We then have transfer again of an acetylglucosamine from UDP to give this intermediate. At this point, this is then flipped to the outside by a flippase, and then we have a series of both transglycosylases and transpeptidases, which stitch together the actual framework of peptidoglycan through either 3-3 or 3-4 crosslinking. Now, we sort of look to try to understand some of the earlier stages in terms of um, assembly of the pentapeptide in terms of the MUR enzymes. So that required us initially to purify each of the enzymes. So we went away and expressed each one in E. coli, purified um, mu C, mu D, mu E, and mu F. Um, ignore the last two because they were involved in another project. And then um, in collaboration with the University of Warwick and um, Professor Chris Dowson and Adrian Lloyd, um, we developed what was a phosphate release assay 
where we could sequentially add each amino acid and look at the release of ADP. And this worked really nicely in terms of setting up a, a coupled assay looking at the synthesis of the initial pathway in terms of mu ligase and the pentapeptide. So again, this sort of summarizes um, what we've done here. Basically, we've taken each of the mu enzymes C, D, E, and F and sequentially added each of the amino acids to build up this intermediate. But one of the interesting features of the mycobacterial cell wall is that not all of the peptidoglycan in terms of the muonac is N-acetated. Some of the residues are N-glycolated. And we wanted to try and understand what would be the influence of having an N-glycolar unit in this pathway. Because like most bacteria, if you make something, you make it for a reason. So this came about quite clearly when we started to look at the kinetics. And basically for UDP and MERNAC, when we look at the KCAT versus UDP ed MERNAC, it is highly distinct in that we get a 32-fold increase in catalytic efficiency. So clearly, this as a substrate is much better for MERC than the UDP and acetyl glucosamine. And what happened was that when we went through and analyzed each of the MUR enzymes, we would see an increase in preference for the UDP and glycolyl precursor substrate but that would drop off as we went through the cascade of the MUR enzymes. So this is quite interesting. We don't know exactly what this means, but it's an interesting observation in terms of a very subtle switch in terms of a substrate leads to a very different biochemical phenotype. I'd like to sort of move now on to the next layer of the cell wall, which is basically how arabinogalactan is synthesized. So really here, we start with what we refer to as the GTAB glycosyl transferase, which are involved in assembling the galactan portion of arabinogalactan. And the key fact here is that GTAB glycosyl transferases use sugar nucleotides. Now, in terms of the synthesis of the galactan portion, we have to first generate the, the substrate primer for, for extension. So starting from n glucosamine, which is attached to um, a polyprenol through a pyrophosphate linkage, we have the transfer of ramnose from TDP ramnose via wobble. We then have the addition of galactose from UDP GALF, which is quite an unusual sh sugar substrate donor because normally um, UDP gal exists in the pyranose form, but if you remember when I was talking about the overall architecture of the cell wall, the galactose residue exists as, as a furanose sugar. We then have GLFT, which adds two galactose residues, and then we have GLFT2, which goes on to add around about sort of 25 to 30 residues. So obviously, in terms of the synthesis of the polysaccharide backbone in terms of galactan, it's not a homogeneous polymer, but it's around 25 to 30 residues. And at that point, it stopped. This is then flipped across the membrane. And now we start to evoke the use of a different type of substrate to make the arabinan segment of arabinogalactan. And this requires a whole set of new enzymes and also a different type of substrate. So here we're not using sugar nucleotides because now because of the location of the polymer to which we're attaching our sugar substrate. So here we have to use what we refer to as DPA, which basically is decaprenol monophosphorol arabinose. And it comes through this pathway in terms of utilizing PRPP, which is um, ribose, phosphate, pyrophosphate, and attaching basically a polyprenol unit to that, and then we have dephosphorylation on the five position. We described a nice sort of series of experiments where we were able to utilize one of the interesting features in that clearly what we're looking at are essential enzymes in mycobacterium tuberculosis. But what you can do is if you go to related sort of cousins of mycobacteria, such as 
Carini bacteria, you can actually make quite stable cell wall mutants. So we took advantage of this and we made an AFTA mutant in Carini bacteria. And what that allowed us to do is um, map using mass spectrometry the precise position at which the first arabinose residue is added to the galactam backbone. So we were able to show that AFTA would sequentially add at the 8th, 10th, and 12th position. And those were the only positions that we would find this particular sugar attached in our AFTA mutant. We then went on to look at ethambutol, because ethambutol is a key drug that's used for tuberculosis therapy, and we know that it targets aspects of arabinan biosynthesis. And what we were able to show was that basically the EMB proteins, EMB A and B, would synthesize the bulk of the arabinan segments of arabinogalactan, catalyzing alpha-1,5 linkages. Now, we need to understand how those linkages were then branched in terms of 1,3 linkages. And this is where we discovered this enzyme, AFTB, again utilizing bacteria as a surrogate where we could obtain a stable mutant and understand the chemical phenotype of that mutant. We were able to show that the, the AFTB was responsible for forming these branching type units in the arabinogalactan structure. What I'd like to do is go back a little bit and talk a little bit about the substrate um, in terms of DPA, because we've talked about DPA in terms of providing the substrate for arabinan biosynthesis in arabinogalactan, and later I'll show that it's involved in liparabinomanan. But it's made by two enzymes, DPRE1 and DPRE2. So we start from what we call DPR, which is the ribose version of the sugar. DPE, DPRE1, um, catalyzes the oxidation at the two position to give this keto intermediate, which is then reduced by DPRE2 to give inversion at the two position um, to give DPA. Now, our interests really came to to this sort of area really came from what was happening in terms of TB drug discovery and new anti that were being discovered that were targeting DPRE1. So we'd worked on DPRE1 sort of several years ago and we thought we would go back and investigate um, biochemically what was happening in terms of DPRE1 inhibition and also try to look at DPRE1 in complex with some of these inhibitors. So in terms of summary, um, these were initially identified by phenotypic screening, which I'll talk about later in terms of some of the translational work that we're doing. And by generating um, resistant mutants, um, it was demonstrated that you had this um, cysteine to glycine or serine conversion, which gave resistance, and also that there was um, covalent binding in the active site of DPRE1 in terms of the BTZ compounds. One of the big problems that the field faced at the time, and um, Professor Stuart Cole from Switzerland was also working in this area at the time, was the fact that um, we had a huge problem in terms of trying to obtain soluble DPRE1. And we solved this problem in that we utilize this quite a lot in the laboratory, is co-expression of TB proteins in E. coli with TB chaperones. And this worked really nicely for us in terms of purifying significant quantities of DPRE1. So we had purified DPRE1, we also had DPRE2, and we set up a simple biochemical assay where we took radio-labeled DPRE substrate, we added in DPRE1 and DPRE2, and looked at the conversion of basically DPR to DPA. As soon as you add in inhibitors, what you see is an inhibition of that conversion. And if we split the reaction up where if we just look at DPRE1 addition, what we can see is the formation of DPX, which is this intermediate, which is transient. But what you can see is that as you add in inhibitor, you can see DPX sort of go away. So you're showing that you're inhibiting DPRE1. And also, those compounds have activity against whole bugs as well. <clears throat> 
So having a nice sort of biochemical assay and showing the effect of these inhibitors, we went on to solve the crystal structure. Um, <clears throat> basically, we were able to show that um, a substrate binding pocket and an FAD binding site, and basically where the inhibitor was binding. What was interesting was that you could see that where the resistant mutants were isolated and the spontaneous resistant mutants were um, co-occupied by the corresponding inhibitors that we were looking at. I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but this was published um, a couple of years ago um, by Sarah Batt in my laboratory, appeared in PNAS, where she described the reporting of the crystal structure and all the complexes in terms of DPRE1. Typically, if you, if you do one thing, then someone else will come and ask you to do another thing. And working in collaboration with Peter Schultz from the Scripps Institute, we were able to look at his compounds, um, TCA1, which is shown here. And basically, we were able to show that um, adding TCA1 had the same effect as adding in BTZ-type compounds in terms of inhibiting DPR to DPA formation, which we show here. Again, shown here again in a, a dose response. Again, we were able to complex DPRE1 with TCA1 and again show the exact location of inhibitor binding. So this was published by um, Wang in PNAS um, a few years ago. What really intrigued us about the BTZ, BTZ work at the time was the fact that um, you could actually isolate Arabinan-deficient mutants in Carinibacteria, but Carinibacteria was still sensitive in those mutants to BTZ. So we were a bit unclear in terms of the killing mechanism because you've taken away the substrate, but you can still kill the bacterium. So our hypothesis at the time was, um, does DPR accumulation, because that would be the natural block in the pathway when you inhibit DPRE1, does that reduce the pool of decaprenol phosphate? Because decaprenol phosphate is a, is a key sort of ingredient in many pathways, i.e. peptidoglycan. So well, is, it, is it acting in terms of synthetic lethality and then we're poisoning the bugs in terms of killing them? So we did a simple experiment at the time where we looked at the killing of bacteria, but also when we've overexpressed UPPS, which is an enzyme that's involved in um, polyprenol synthesis to see whether we could ramp up the synthesis in terms of generating more polyprenol phosphate to overcome the effect of BTZ. And this panel in the middle clearly shows this, that you know, when we add in BTZ at 20 micrograms per mil, um, you can see that we're inhibiting the bugs. However, when we have UPS, sort of overexpress, we don't see killing at the same concentration, showing that UPS actually rescues the effect of BTZ. So what this has enabled us to do is to build up this hypothesis that basically DPRE1 blocks here in terms of conversion of DPR to DPX. This then leads to a funneling of decaprenal phosphate to DPR, and we see accumulation of DPR. However, if we overexpress UPPS, we get more decaprenol phosphate synthesized, which then goes in through the peptidoglycan pathway and rescues the synthesis of the bacterium. So these studies um, has, have allowed us to sort of revise our model in terms of cell wall biosynthesis, in terms of um, where we're at. Um, so we've figured out how the galactan segment is synthesized. We've learned how AFTA adds the first arabinose residue to the galactan backbone. We've shown how EMBA and B catalyze this linear extension in terms of 1,5 synthesis, how AFTC adds this branching unit, and also how AFTB cap off the synthesis of arabinogalactan. I'm going to switch and talk a little bit about liparabinomanan. It also contains a rabinan domain, which is structurally very similar to arabinogalactan. It's a major component of the cell wall. It has this core manan domain, um, which, is, which we term lipomanan. And it's attached to the membrane through a 
myo-inositol anchor, and we have this linear pathway of phosphatidyl-inositol manicides leading to lipomanan to leading to liparabinomanan. And both of these molecules have quite profound sort of stimulatory effects um, individually if you isolate them and give them to macrophages and so on. So they're quite important molecules in their own right. So what we were able to establish through a series of studies was that basically starting with um, inositol, um, we could transfer manners from GDP manners by PIMA to give what we term PIM1. We then have a transfer of um, a fatty acid from an acyl-CoA to this position of that mannose residue. We would then have addition of mannose from PIM-B from GDP mannose to this position. PIM-C would add another mannose residue. PIM-D, a fourth residue. And then this is when we have a critical stage where we, the molecule is flipped. At this point, all we've been using are sugar nucleotides. Now we use a different substrate, very analogous to um, what we've seen in terms of the arabinan segments of arabinogalactan and liparabinomanan, in that what we use is decaprenol monophosphoral mannose, DPM. And this basically adds a series of mannose residues catalyzed by MTPB, um, which give us a linear backbone extending from our PIM4 molecule we then have a second enzyme that introduces mannose branches. We then have further extension in terms of the mannan backbone by MPTA, and then further branching. At this point, lipomannan is then extended using very similar machinery that we find for arabinan in arabinogalactan. We then have various capping motifs, and these vary between different mycobacteria in terms of what you're looking at, whether it be manlam, in terms of mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacterium canarsi, or mycobacterium bovis. Or you can have um, um, inositol phosphate caps, which we find in slow growers, such as mycobacterium smegmatis. As we've shown earlier, in the case of liparabinomanan, rather than M A and B, we have M C, which functions in terms of assembling the arabinan segment. So this really shows a schematic in terms of um, the pathway in terms of lamb biosynthesis. So the final sort of molecule of the cell wall that I'll describe is mycolic acids. So this is a, a simplistic sort of um, picture where we have basically an alpha alkyl chain, this beta hydroxy unit, and this myelomicrate chain. This is typically around sort of 50 to 60 carbon atoms in size. This is around C22 to C26. What's unusual about mycobacteria is that they have two different types of fatty acid synthases. We have fatty acid synthase 1, which is typically found in animals. It's a multifunctional polypeptide and carries out all the necessary activities you require in terms of fatty acid elongation. However, uh, mycobacteria also have what typically you find in bacteria, which is fatty acid synthase 2. And this is where you have distinct proteins which are dissociated, which come together as a complex. So what we've thought for a long time is that FAST1 performs de novo synthesis to provide precursors, and then FAST2 um, extends these short primers into mycolic acids. And really through probably around 10 years of effort, we've built up this pathway where we've gone through systematically studied all of these enzymes in terms of how they function biochemically, genetically, and in terms of substrate requirements in terms of how mycolic acids are assembled. I'm not going to go into all the details, but the key sort of features that I want to mention are INHA, which is involved in this step in FAST2. If you think back in terms of the antituberculars that I mentioned earlier on, this is the target of isoniazid. <coughs> 
So really, in that pathway, we've gone from genes to targets in terms of elucidating the pathway. So really, what we wanted to do now is try to take our knowledge further in terms of translate some of the microbiology that we've been doing in terms of looking for, for new anti-tuberculars. Now, if we look at the current state of the TB drug pipeline, what we find is that there's quite a lot of activity in phase two, phase three clinical trials. There's some in lead optimization, but there's quite a big gap here. And one of the problems is that a lot of the candidates that people are working are not the ideal chemically. And as what we find with drug discovery is that we have high attrition rates. So not much is being developed from lead optimization to phase two. The other issue in that, um, probably 10 years ago, the main sort of avenue for people in drug discovery is to look at their particular protein of interest and to try and develop inhibitors, which were probably fantastic micromolar inhibitors. But the big problem with TB is that if you don't get them into the bacterium, they ain't going to do anything. So what we've reverted to now is to look at how people used to look for antituberculars sort of in the 50s and 60s by using more of a phenotypic approach. However, you have to be careful when you're doing a phenotypic approach. And I thoroughly recommend that people look at this commentary in um, Nature, which appeared um, what, two years ago now, about the pains molecules. When you go out and look at commercial libraries, there are a lot of inhibitors out there that are very nasty um, that would never make it into a hit-to-lead optimization program. So you have to be very careful in terms of your, your starting points. So we started a collaboration with GSK sort of maybe four or five years ago where we started to look in a, in a phenotypic way in terms of whether we could look for new anti-tuberculars. And this involved then the screening of a three million compound repository at GSK via a phenotypic approach using TB. And this led to a 10,000 sort of collection of hits that are around 10 micromolar against the bacterium. This was then filtered down into what we refer to as the TB box set, which were inhibitors of around one micromolar. And these are now progressing through this sort of cascade of events in terms of drug discovery. So we've come in now and we're looking at these particular hits in terms of trying to understand their mode of action. So we have three strategies. One is to try to identify cellular targets by whole genome sequencing of spontaneous resistant mutants. The second approach is using quantitative chemical proteomics. And the third approach is to use a sort of hybrid phenotypic target-based strategy. Now, we're hoping that these strategies will lead to new hits to leads that will go into optimization programs, will lead to us uncovering new targets, and also provide better tools in terms of understanding the biochemical pathways that we're interested in. And this is of particular um, relevance. Uh, if you look at strategy three, basically you could bias your phenotypic hits in terms of a particular target in a pathway if you were interested solely in a pathway. So we've published several papers recently in terms of looking at these hits. But what I wanted to mention in particular was something that we published recently um, in Nature Microbiology, which appeared in January, was the use of chemical proteomics. We were interested in this family of compounds here, the THPPs. And originally it was shown through the generation of spontaneous resistant mutants that they targeted this transporter, MMPL3. And we were puzzled by this at the time because when we went back in the literature, you can actually find a whole number of classes in terms of targeting MMPL3. And one of the interesting things that we found was that actually overexpression of MMPL3 led to an increased sensitivity of THPPs. So we've used um, initially to look at the phenotype in terms of what happens when you treat. So one of the striking things that we find is that when we treat with THPPs is that you get a very strong inhibition of mycolic acid synthesis both in terms of total mycolic acid synthesis that 
mycolic acid products that you find in the cell, and also in terms of cell wall bound mycolic acids. When we take an inactive form of the drug where we have a, an isomer, we find no inhibition. So it's quite clear that the THPPs are targeting some aspect of de novo mycolic acid biosynthesis. Interestingly, if you look at related MMPL3 inhibitors, we don't see that sort of phenotype showing quite unique selectivity. And using chemical proteomics and pull-down assays, we were able to isolate this particular target, ECHA6. It's involved in the catabolic part of fatty acid pathway, but it's inactive in that it doesn't have all the residues that you associate with catabolism of an enol hydratase. We went on to show that basically if you do a genetic approach and you um, knock out ECHA6 um, using a conditional expression system, you can lead to cell lysis and death, showing that basically a chemical and genetic inhibition of mycolic acid synthesis that we show here, which is coming from this point in terms of the time course in terms of labeling, you can get inhibition of mycolic acid synthesis. We went on to show that basically if you overexpress ECHA6, you can get restoration of inhibition where you don't see inhibition now up to two micromolar, whereas at sort of 0.32 micromolar, you're seeing complete inhibition in a whole cell assay. So you're showing whole cell target in engagement at this point. We went on to do some um, binding studies, both in terms of ACL-CoA binding and also binding in terms of the drug. But one of the key things that we found is that we went on to solve the crystal structure of ECHA6, both with ACL-CoA's and also with inhibitor. But the key thing that we did was that we've obviously gone through and demonstrated sort of whole cell target engagement, but could we, could we demonstrate in vivo target engagement? And we did this quite nicely when we took a resistant mutant of ECHA6, which we knew would still... Um, bind the ACL-CoA, but wouldn't bind the drug, and put this into an animal, animal model of infection and see whether we could titrate resistance in an in vivo setting. And the key point here is that you can see a, a clear shift in terms of a lack of inhibition when we have ECHA6 with our point mutant overexpressed. So really, we wanted to bring this together in terms of a model and one of the things that we thought about was that how would this sort of catalytically inactive enol hydratase fit within our model in terms of inhibition of mycolic acid synthesis? And it's been described in other bacteria where particular enzymes function as like shuttle mechanisms to provide substrates from the catabolic pathway to the anabolic pathway. And we looked to see whether ECHA6 was actually interacting using a two-hybrid approach with the other members of the anabolic pathway in terms of fatty acid synthesis. And we were able to show interaction with both CASA and also um, INHA. So we could show that basically this model could be postulated in terms of ECHA6 feeding in fatty acids from the catabolic pathway into a FAS2 system. And that's why when we block here with THPPs, we block mycolic acid biosynthesis. The final strategy is in terms of the phenotypic sort of um, hybrid type approach. So we did this for DPRE1. So where we've looked at, um, if you overexpress DPRE1, can we transfer resistance when we look in a, in a phenotypic screen? And basically, we screened the whole collection in terms of the 177 TB box set. And as you can see, we've pulled out a number of hits that now, when we overexpress DPRE1, now become resistant to our particular hit compound. So in summary, in terms of the translational part, we're able to use whole genome sequencing in terms of isolating spontaneous resistant mutants and identifying their target. We've also used quantitative chemical proteomics now as a new tool in terms of identifying targets and also this hybrid sort of phenotypic strategy in terms of identifying new targets as well.
Sorry, I've rushed that last part because Neil keeps looking at me saying that I'm going to be out of time. Um, clearly, I don't do all the work and I think I need to pay um, a huge compliment to the people in my laboratory, um, the people who work with me now, and there's many people who've worked with me in the past and some of them still work with me. Um, I don't know why, but they still work with me. Um, also, the PhD students and other colleagues at Birmingham. I have this great debt to pay to GSK, who have been fantastic collaborators over the last four or five years in terms of taking uh, fundamental microbiology knowledge and trying to translate that in terms of new therapeutics for tuberculosis. Clearly, I couldn't do all this work without the significant funding that I've had from different partner organizations, such as the Medical Research Council, the Wellcome Trust, BBSRC, um, James Barntrick is an interesting character who sponsors my research chair at Birmingham. He's the CEO of Citibank, um, a former alumni of, of the University of Birmingham, and also a former um, European program, both in terms of FP7, and also we have a current um, Marie Curie European Industrial Doctorate at Birmingham. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I apologise for being a little bit late.